grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen now to the gospel of our Lord from the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 4. Jesus said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come again. Amen. Do you want to grow? You ask a child if they want to grow. I don't know many children that don't want to grow if they're this height. Taller, right? You want to grow. I, we all want to grow, don't we? You want to grow as a, uh, as a student. You want to grow as a spouse. Don't you want to grow as a parent? Don't you want to grow? Well, just about every way but this way, right? We don't want to grow that way, but we, we all want to be growing. And I'll tell you, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, isn't it true that every one of us who bears the name of Jesus Christ wants to grow spiritually, wants to grow in our relationship with him, wants to grow in our maturity of our Christian life? Really, it isn't a question of whether you want to grow. The real question is how. How will you grow? And the world offers a lot of different answers to that. But God, on, God offers one. And that's his word. And it's in his word today that I want you to trust that God is planting the powerful seed of the gospel. And trust that it will grow and it will produce fruit. First, it will grow. Well, listen to how Jesus began this parable. This first parable, he said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, and you know, all, all he does is just put the seed out there, and guess what? Something happens. He doesn't understand it, but it grows. If you want to grow, you need to scatter some seed. The question then is, what seed? What kind of seed should you scatter? There are some that scatter the seed of guilt, and of fear, they'll say, if you really want to grow, then you have to do what God says. Follow his word. And if you do that, you'll grow. And if you're not growing, it must be because you're not doing something right. Some scatter the seed of need. Are you lonely? Well, then we'll get you some friends. Then you can grow. Do you have children? Maybe they need a place to play. If we just fill all your needs up and take care of all those little holes in your life, then you can flourish and grow. Some will scatter the seed of prayer. If you're not growing, perhaps you're not praying hard enough. Or maybe you're not praying the right prayer. I'll give you the right prayer. And then you'll grow. Some will scatter seeds of emotion. Come to worship with us. You're going to hear a message that's so powerful and music that just is going to lift your spirits. And if you're bored, you can't be growing. So we'll thrill you enough that you'll grow finally. My dear friends, do not get sucked into thinking that any of those things are seeds that can actually provide true growth that is God-pleasing. Now, that does not mean that we want you to leave worship not uplifted 
or to fill all your needs in Christ by his word, or to pray fervently, or to do what God commands, all of it. But in and of itself, none of those things produce the true growth that Christ is talking about that he wants in the kingdom of God. There is only one thing that is that true seed. It's the gospel that produces his results. It's the gospel. It's God's word. Specifically, it's the news and the love of Jesus Christ and the peace that comes from his life lived for you and his love that is for you. It's the power of the word, and I hate to admit it, but there are times that I have not trusted the power of God's word. A preacher shouldn't say that, so I probably should step out of the pulpit when I'm saying something like that. But there are times in my ministry and in my life, I have to admit, if I'm honest, that I've doubted the power of the word. And God's given me some powerful examples of that to my shame. I remember after September 11, 2001, when that cruel terrorist attack came upon our nation in New York City. I was serving at Risen Savior on the northwest side of Milwaukee at the time, and we decided there needed to be a community prayer service to try to bring people around God's word to look for answers in that word. And so we went to the seven or, seven or 570 plus condominiums to the one side of us called the Woodlands, and we put a flyer at every single door. And for the first time, the apartment buildings next to the church, over 300 of them, the managers actually let us get into the building. They opened the doors for us so we could put a flyer by every single door. And then we had the community prayer service. We waited for the people to come to hear the word of God. And guess what? No one showed up. Not one. Uh, members from Risen Savior came. But no one knew from the community came to the church. What's with this word? <laughs> and then the next morning, a man showed up with one of those flyers in his hands. And for the next six weeks, we began to study God's word together. And then he disappeared. <laughs> I mean, he admitted his life was a complete mess, and it was. But then he just disappeared. And you, you kind of start wondering as a pastor, well, what did I do wrong? You know. Should I have taught this lesson in a different way? Was I trying to push too hard on certain things and, and, and kind of call him to repentance on some things? Maybe I should have just waited on that and done this instead of that. Four years passed. And then one Sunday, there was this man in church with another man. And he introduced himself after service and said, you gotta, you got to meet my friend and you got to share God's word with him. He said, you remember me, right? And I'm going, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, it was that man. He was back four years later. He said, you know, my life has completely turned around. He said, I've stopped doing drugs. I've stopped dealing drugs. He was a heavy dealer of drugs. It's really why he had to leave the neighborhood, because he couldn't stay for his own safety and stop dealing and doing drugs. That's why he disappeared said, my life has completely changed. i got two jobs now. My marriage is back together again, and I owe it all to you. Well, on that account, he was completely wrong. He said, and to those lessons we'd studied in God's Word, there he was right. You thought that God's Word hadn't produced the dramatic result you expected in the time frame the preacher had set to his own shame. You see... It's like a mustard seed, Jesus said, that powerful word. Little, insignificant seemingly, but it can produce results that amaze. Parents, do you need to remember that? Pastors, do we need to remember that? Teachers, Amanda, Justin, as you begin your ministry here, there may be times in which you expect dramatic results. You know, you're getting the powerful word to these children. And yet, it doesn't seem to happen at your schedule and in the way you'd like. Growth happens. Trust it. Stop doubting. Believe what God says. Parents, pastors, teachers. God compares it to a shower that will accomplish his purpose in his time. Oh, we do have the ability not to plant the seed. 
to, to avoid it. I mean, you could get this flyer and throw it away. You can never even look at all the opportunities you have to let the seed get into your heart. Absolutely true. And trust me, your pastors here want you to have the word. But instead, you, instead of plowing into the word, you can instead scatter seeds of fear and doubt in your family by not getting into it, by not countering what goes on in your own heart. Instead of gathering together with your fellow Christians as God commands, you have the power uh, to choke it out with the weeds of your own hurt or anger. Yes. But what's interesting is that you can't make it grow even if the word gets in your heart. The word happens. The growth happens. The word works. No more than a child can will, or by their sheer willpower, make themselves grow to be the next NBA star, seven foot tall, can you make yourself grow. But growth happens. It's God's work, and thank God for it. If growing were left up to us, by how smart we are in the way that we parent, or the way that we pastor, it was all dependent on how well your lessons were planned. Not that you don't want to plan them well or how you model it, then think of how much doubt and fear you'd have about whether growth would ever happen. But it happens in spite of our failings, and that's a great comfort. So if you truly want to plant the word, maybe we have to spend less time sowing our own oats and more time planting the word in ourselves first. And how do you plant that? You find lasting peace and, and joy, not because your week was so great and everything's going so well at work, but because you have God's word. You have a relationship with him based on Jesus Christ. You, you, you get excited to come to Bible class, not because you know you're going to be thrilled by the teacher so much as you are confident you are going to hear the word of God. And you live your life motivated because you keep finding the forgiveness and peace you need in that word. And after you've planted the word in yourself, then you plan it in those around you. Do you want to be a better spouse, a better parent? Well, do you really want to help someone grow? <coughs> then get them into the Word. Believe in Christian education. It's a great comfort, whether it's from kindergarten to senior Bible study and everything in between. The Word works. Sow it. Sow it everywhere. On the altar of faith, Lutheran in Antioch. You know where that is? Okay. Um, there is an altar painting in which it describes paint is a painting of someone sowing seed. And, and the results that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower and the seed. You see it right on the painting. There's some on the path seed that's never really put into the ground that's being eaten away by the birds. There's some seed on rocky soil that never really grows up because it has no roots. And there's seed that's being choked out by the weeds. But that's all you see in the painting. And Jesus spoke of four results, but here you only see the path, the rocky soil, and the weed-riddled patch. What gives? Well, to understand that painting, you have to see the perspective. The sower is sowing the seed right out of the painting at you because that's where the good soil is, where people are gathered to hear God's word. And when you know that, you know that it will produce fruit. Good soil will produce fruit. Listen again to the end of this parable. He talks about, he puts a sickle to it. You know, it, it grows by itself, but there's always a harvest. There's always an end goal in mind. And that, too, is determined by God. What a comfort for an administrator of high school to know that in the end, yes, you want to care about scores and success in life and college for our kids and careers that are great, but it's about the ultimate harvest of heaven. And that is going to be determined by God. Somewhere along the line, someone planted the seed in you and in your heart, and it has grown. And maybe there are times where you worry about your grandkids or... You, parents, you worry about your teenagers, understandable, but I want you to think for a second about the way your parents worried about you. 
during those years. See, there's, there's something you can do, I guess. I'm going to encourage you to do three things. To weed, to water, and to wait for God's harvest to come. It starts out with weeding because Satan is always scattering seeds of doubt and, and seeds that produce nothing but something that's going to choke out your faith. So you and I, in our families and in our own lives, have to continually be pulling out the weeds. How do you do that? Well, in your own life, it starts out by confessing your own sins, being specific about it. I, I, I have a temper. I, I'm easily annoyed. I am doing this that's wrong. That's plucking out those weeds before they take firm root. And maybe you have to help your kids do the same. And then water. Watering the seed of the gospel. That's really God, well, as you repent and confess your sins, it allows God then to water, to, to, to nourish what he is doing. Because it allows God at that moment to say, I forgive you. My son came for you. He lived in your place. He never lost his temper. He was not easily annoyed. He did all of these things in your place. He has fulfilled the law for you. You are forgiven. And as you hear those words, and as you have that peace, trust me, growth happens. That's towards the harvest that he intends. And then, wait. God will harvest his crop at his time. Confident that there is good soil where God's people are gathered to hear his word and where the weeds are continually pulled and the gospel continues to nourish that seed, you can be confident there will be a bumper crop. Amen. Plant the powerful seed of the gospel. Amen. Please stand.